answer. Uh, if you have any problems hearing, uh, let me know uh, using the questions format. Um, anyways, uh, I wish everybody uh, happy holidays. Hope you had a great New Year celebration. Uh, I'm back in the United States from Sicily. Uh, was there for the last month, and life was hard. Um, but uh, back for uh, a new year, and um, we're going to have two webinars uh, coming up. This obviously today's, which starts uh, an FCPA review, and then next week at the same time, uh, same date on the Tuesday, uh, we're going to do a review of. Um, sanctions enforcement, which I think is sort of a new and pressing area. And uh, so I'm hoping that uh, you can sign up for that as well. Uh, as always, uh, everything will be uploaded to the YouTube channel uh, that we maintain. Uh, and we'll um, uh, make the slides available. Just send me an email after uh, today, and I'll send you the slides for uh, today's show. Uh, and anything else uh, you need in terms of slides, anything that's on the YouTube channel, I have slides for it, and I'm happy to share them with you. So uh, this is, uh, you know, obviously it's my favorite topic to talk about uh, uh, since I work so much in this area. But uh, 2014, as uh, as everybody knows, uh, sort of ended with a bang. Um, but I always like to look at the FCPA. Uh, there are a lot of issues here to talk about, uh, very interesting issues, I think, that have come up. Um, I think some of it represents the maturation uh, of the program uh, and that there's sort of, uh, we're not going to get as many surprises uh, in things. We sort of are learning the sort of way that the Justice Department takes, you know, is sort of solving problems and dealing with problems. And we're learning more, uh, obviously, about the SEC. Uh, which seems to be a little bit more active in different areas. So um, I think all of this, uh, 2014, just by the numbers, uh, was a big year. Uh, it was the second biggest year uh, in the history of FCPA enforcement uh, in that uh, 10 companies settled, but the more important figure was for $1.56 billion, which was less than 2010 which is the year of Penalpina and all of the settlements uh, in 2010. I think the AE was that year as well. So uh, 11 individuals were indicted for FCPA offenses. One case in which had six uh, individuals, uh, separate case in dealing with the India mining, um, and there's only been one person apprehended in that. Uh, we had guilty pleas, the BizJet CEO, two Alstom officials, uh, two direct access partners, uh, the last two indicted uh, pled guilty. Uh, we have two trials coming up, uh, Siegelman uh, in Petro Tiger, uh, the co-CEO, and we have an Alstom uh, executive still planning to go to trial at this point. And we have 11 corporate declinations, which we know about, which have been made public. Um, all in all, though, in terms of the rate of enforcement actions, the rate of investigations that are publicly disclosed and declinations that are uh, disclosed, um, what we're seeing is sort of a very similar pattern for the last few years. Uh, you know, 2010 was an outlier because of the Shock Show Sting case and all the individuals being arrested, but uh, pretty much uh, in terms of the level of work that's going on, uh, I think. Um, it's pretty steady in that respect. I think we the reason that stuff came at the end of the year, I'll talk about uh, two reasons that I think, one of which was having a new uh, criminal division chief, uh, Leslie Caldwell, come in, and she brought her in her own people, and they probably took more time to review certain things to sign off on it just to show that they're new and you know want to assert their authority and all that stuff. So let's go, um, like I said, total corporate fine. 2014, uh, again, looks uh, like a big year. And, uh, you know, 1.5 billion. Uh, and like I said, 2010 was the biggest year uh, that the FCPA, when we hit 1.8 billion. Um, I do think it's going to get a little bit higher. Uh, I, when, and we'll talk about Walmart. When Walmart comes out, I think it'll probably be the biggest case. 
Um, and I think it's going to involve individuals as well. That's sort of one of my predictions. Um, the headlines, thank goodness, thank God, thank everybody. Uh, the ABA case was finally settled. The rumors were that the, you know, the chief of the FTPA section, Patrick Stokes, had said at the end of September, Avon was going to be settled. He was looking forward to it. And of course, it didn't happen until December. Um, two cases we have landed in the top 10 of all time. The, the first case was Alcoa, which is beginning of the year. The second case, obviously, Alstom, which everybody knows about, the $772 million one. Uh, I think a couple of things. We saw here this year uh, absolutely the value of cooperation uh, in terms of sell, you know, voluntary disclosures coming in, remediating. I'll point out in one case in particular, one step that I think was pretty valuable uh, that one of the companies did and I think earned it uh, a lot of credit. Um, we also learned the value of non-cooperation or resistance. Alstom's resistance, by the way, is legendary uh, in terms of just denying uh, and not complying with grand jury subpoenas. Mary Ubini, or I don't know if you pronounce it right, uh, if you look at who, for example, goes to jail in the antitrust cartel cases, uh, a lot of times the Japanese companies never uh, cave in or concede. And uh, officials there, when they go to jail, their families are taken care of. And uh, here in the United States, they go to jail, the officials, the families taken care of in Japan. And when they return, they're treated like heroes. Uh, there's a culture, I think, of non-cooperation. Uh, and what the Justice Department tried to do in both non-cooperation cases is make the penalty very clear and make the punishment very clear. Um, another theme from this year is, uh, contrary to all my ranting about how we spend too much time on gifts, meals, and entertainment and travel expenditures, of course, right after I say that and repeat myself a million times, uh, the SEC comes out, and even the Justice Department had a case which had a lot of, uh, Avon has a lot of gifts, meals, entertainment, and travel expenditures as sources for funding bribes. Uh, the message from Smith & Wesson, which we're going to talk about, is small companies can be targeted by the SEC and also even when your entry into a foreign market was not very successful but you're paying bribes all over the place or, or promising to pay bribes or trying to pay bribes, you're going to pay a price. Um, and as always, as always, we saw third parties at the root of every, you know, a lot of things here, not, uh, not just, you know, Avon has its own distinct characters uh, in it and the senior management that are in it. Uh, and we'll talk about that, but uh, third parties are at the root of Alstom. They're at the root of uh, a lot of these problems. And culture. I think the point is that culture, uh, if you read the facts from Alstom, you read the facts from uh, Avon, you know what the culture was. Uh, you know there was no culture of compliance. You know there was no value put on ethics, and you know that in a culture like that, it's very easy for business needs to take over and for compliance needs to sort of uh, fade into the background. And that's exactly what happened uh, in terms of uh, some of those cases that we're, we're talking about. Well, next year, and I think the big uh, the news to me was we didn't have many, uh, you know, the ramp up in individual enforcement, be it from the SEC and the DOJ, you know, the SEC did not bring a case for two years against any individuals uh, until they settled the, uh, the gifts for the Saudi Arabian case, which we'll talk about. But uh, I think what we're going to see next year is more of a push on the individuals. We're going to have some follow on cases. Um, I think. The message that was, uh, there was a speech given by the deputy, one of the deputies from the criminal division, about the fact that companies, when you cooperate, they want you to build cases against uh, your executives and employees. In other words, one way to cooperate is you come in, you, you, do, you, know, you confess to everything, you try to remediate everything, but you also tie up in a little bow for them, for the government, a case against certain executives to say, here's all the evidence against this person, you don't have to look too far, and now you can go nail this person. Um, and it's funny because you can see that same pattern or the expectation that was actually 
successfully done by, for example, BP in the oil spill prosecution. Uh, from the Gulf, there were certain individuals who were prosecuted uh, out of that, uh, you know, horrible tragedy. And a lot of that came, that was all put together by BP's internal investigation. All of those cases uh, was based upon evidence that they had gathered and they disclosed to the government and the government then indicted the cases. So what I think is going on in the FCPA world is that they're going to push companies to do more on building cases against their own executives um, and employees. Uh, my only point with regard to that is they should have been doing that from the beginning. Um, and I don't know why they weren't. In the antitrust division, that is something that is very well entrenched that we expect you to bring uh, evidence to us about who was responsible for this. Remember that a company uh, can't get uh, in trouble, uh, you know, unless there's somebody's activity um, and there's somebody's activity that can, that's illegal that can be attributed to the company. So there's got to be somebody who holds all the elements of the crime and committed all of the elements of the crime. And uh, so if this isn't something that shouldn't be, that you know, shouldn't have been attended to or should have been attended to. Uh, the Avon case, I know for a fact there are individuals who are very seriously under uh, investigation. Uh, when you read the facts and you read about the obstruction of justice uh, that went on in that case, um, that they have to prosecute some of those individuals to send the right message. Uh, to senior executives, and uh, so I expect that Avon, uh, sometime this year, some of those officials who were fired and let go, but nonetheless uh, are going to be indicted, and there'll be a case uh, brought against them, like a conspiracy case with counts and uh, multiple counts. Um, I think the SEC is saying uh, in some of their, I mean, the individual prosecutions for Gibbs Field and Entertainment in Saudi Arabia coming from Fleur and were systems. The uh, defense contractor was very, very interesting. Uh, I don't know whether Fleur itself is under investigation, but we're going to talk about that. But to me, uh, they're, to go after individuals on gifts, meals, and entertainment and the expenditures that we're talking about and travel, it was, uh, you know, there were watches and, and lucrative uh, trips, lavish trips. But, um, anyways. So that's a new, uh, I think that's where you're going to get more individuals. I think there could be follow-on cases for the BioRad case in particular, uh, given the Russian facts, the facts in Russia. Mary Beeney, I don't think it's going to happen as much because I think there's statute of limitations issues because it's sort of uh, old. And similarly, I think Hewlett Packard, I'd be surprised, although the facts are pretty egregious. Remember, you're dealing with a five-year statute of limitations. But all that requires is that one act of the conspiracy occur in the last five years uh, to get your uh, to get you within the statute of limitations. But nonetheless, uh, the FCPA unit is. and precedent setting cases with SBM offshore, where DOJ, after years of sort of looking at SBM, uh, it was pretty egregious conduct, just basically handed the case or deferred the whole case to the Dutch prosecutors. Uh, there were things that the SBM legal team did, I think, to try to help that solution along. Um, and I think that uh, DOJ's uh, you know, deference in that case uh, I've seen them in other cases, they take account of other settlements and they may, let's say, reduce the settlement amount based upon, let's say, them paying the German authorities something. But I've never seen, this is the first time we had a whole case just sort of handed over and DOJ bowing out. Uh, the GSK the China case, just to show you, I thought that was a huge last year. Uh, the fizzle, um, the four net. And $480 million. What's going to be very interesting, what is GSK, uh, uh, what's going to be their FCPA settlement here in the United States? 
Uh, uh, believe it or not, even though I'm a, such a nate on the UK Bribery Act, I think this uh, this year uh, they may actually bring a case. Um, I think it'll be a piggyback case, you know, off the United States. Uh, but you may actually see the UK Bribery Act enforced for the first time uh, in a in a sort of context that we know, not in you know a court clerk or somebody else doing something. Uh, that's it. So um, it, I, I want to make sure I've got a couple notes that people are having trouble hearing me. Is there any other? If there is a problem, I can recall it, uh, call in. But uh, let me know if there's a problem. Uh, again, uh, if the audio is going in and out. Um, the last uh, point from the globalization uh, is Brazil. Brazil, uh, the Clean Companies Act, which doesn't have the regulations that they need yet, uh, but Brazil sort of came into the scene and said, we're going to open a case on Amber Air, uh, the, the long going investigation that's been uh, going on in the United States, uh, and they want to uh, try to get into that uh, as well. Um, so. Um, let me do this. Let me try uh, uh, calling right back in, and hopefully we can get uh, a better connection. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, hopefully I'll be back on, and uh, please let me know if you can hear me, uh, if, uh, if, if uh, it's uh, better. I apologize for the uh, complication there. I'm staying at a hotel, and uh, who knows what the coverage is like here. Anyways, um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, let me know if there's problems again, and I can uh, try to uh, call back in if we're having still, uh, uh, still fine. Okay. Uh, Anyways, let's go to the cases that we're going to review, uh, some of the significant cases. Uh, I'm not going to review all of the cases from the year, uh, but these are sort of a list of the cases I'd like to go through. Uh, let's start, obviously, with Alstom, the uh, top 10 case. Uh, look, for years, people were, uh, you know, internal investigations started. The French uh, company uh, just does not yet. Uh, if you work at a French company, I feel your pain. Uh, they just don't understand proactive and uh, you know cooperation. 
Uh, if you look at, uh, there's a reason that we have other French companies in a similar situation. Um, we had 70 million, I mean, this was a systemic breakdown. Uh, I frankly had predicted that it was going to be bigger than Siemens. Um, there were code names for bribe payers. There were consultants and awesome employees who were all interested in uh, bribery. It went everywhere and uh, everywhere you could go uh, to to that. Uh, somebody has written me that the slides are no longer uh, visible. Uh, hopefully that's not true. That's what you're able to see, uh, that that's true. Um, uh, Anyways, going back, and I, I'm sorry, let me go back just a second. The bribery payments, uh, I think the presence of DT as the acquiring company had a huge impact uh, on this. Uh, and the huge impact that it, ha that it happened um, was huge in the sense of here's GE as an ethical, very well-established company about to take over. Uh, one of the reasons they avoided a corporate monitor was because GE was standing there. The reason there was the big push to resolve the case was that there was a deadline by the end of the year uh, and that GE was going to be um, either, you know, it was going to cost them money or whatever uh, if uh, Alstom was not able to resolve this uh, case. Um, the grand jury investigation for years was obstructed. It was legendary hearings for the FCPA community. They would thumb their nose at these grand jury subpoenas. They would beg and plead for the government not to go after them. Uh, that you know, let the lawyers work on it. They're trying to get you know cooperation out of them, but they never did get cooperation out of them. Uh, we had situations where senior management and the board blocked the attorneys from uh, sort of uh, bringing up information. Uh, and, and uh, you know, bringing information to light about the nature and extent of this uh, corruption. It was an absolute systemic breakdown, on par of Siemens, on par of just the worst type of situation you could walk into in terms of a culture of corruption. Uh, In-house counsel, even in the United States, were involved in carrying out and covering up uh, the, the bribery scheme using code names. People were, uh, you know, Pirate one, pirate two, or whatever. They had all names for everybody. So, um, so anyways, that's uh, next. We went to the uh, Avon case, uh, and I call it the ding dongs or whatever. Here again, we had eight for four years. There was basically a systemic, uh, systematic bribery scheme to enter and maintain the door-to-door -door sales market. Remember, Avon went in, got the uh, right to um, to uh, uh, go door to door uh, in China, the first company to do so, and all along the way they were doing cash gifts, meals, travel to all these uh, foreign officials to make sure that they got this and to keep it and to make sure their their uh, it was going along fine and that they were getting access to this market. The interesting thing here is internal audit prepares a report describing the bribery scheme, pushes it up uh, the ladder. The head of internal audit, who's one of the individuals now under investigation, uh, basically says, uh, you know, let's get rid of this report, uh, sanitize this report, call the allegations up unsubstantiated, and then go from there. Uh, the sanitizing of the report led to even an order to the uh, auditor who put this together. Uh, to gather the copies of the initial report and get rid of them. Um, and there was a question as to whether or not it went to one person's personal home. Look, Avon is known for doing so many things wrong in this case. One was when they uh, publicly tried to negotiate with the Justice Department, which is one of the stupider strategies you can ever do, and say they offered $15 million to uh, to resolve the case. That was probably one of the dumber strategies. Number two um, is that um, just their use uh, and management of outside counsel was legendary in terms of being uh, just uh, inefficient and ineffectual. Um, the interesting thing was that everybody thought that they, when they started sort of a global investigation that there was going to be more corruption found than, than just the China market. But for whatever reason, this thing just ended up with the China market. Nonetheless, $135 million 
uh, proving once again that the cover-up is worse than the crime, I think we're going to see some individuals who were fired and will be prosecuted, uh, as I mentioned before. Here's a, and this, these are the types of cases, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't mean to belittle Alstom and Avon, but we've seen those before. Um, but there are some very interesting issues that have come up in some of the other cases. Uh, and these are smaller cases that just didn't get, you know, the, the uh, uh, didn't get the public attention or the analysis that I think uh, was warranted. Um, BioRad is an interesting case, and I think it's a warning case about probably one of the biggest trends that I see, and I think people should be very, very aware of in terms of the Justice Department and how the Justice Department is facing the, or is going to deal with some of these issues down the road. Number one, uh, so we had a $14 million settlement with the SEC, the DOJ, there was a non-prosecution agreement and a two-year uh, monitor. BioRad had a lot of problems, and uh, they did the sort of trifecta, I call it a voluntary disclosure, cooperation, and remediation. If you look at the facts uh, and the primary facts of what a Uh, hello again. Sorry about that. I got cut off, and I apologize again. But we were talking about the BioRad case, and the focus of the activity in BioRad was in Russia, where BioRad paid commissions of, I think it was 15 to 30 percent to intermediaries for virtually no services. They never proved that there were bribes paid, but they certainly proved that there was no logical explanation for this that internal controls were violated, that senior managers approved these contracts despite knowing that there were no services provided, and the senior managers were involved in ensuring that there were false entries for these expenses as well. So the more important point to me is, remember this, the Justice Department has never brought a criminal case standalone, a standalone criminal case on circumvention of internal controls. Uh, internal controls has always gone along with bribes, where they could say there were bribes and circumvention of internal controls. The interesting point here, and it's really a, a very important trend, is when you read the facts, it's clear the Justice Department dug into the internal controls. You know, the SEC usually does that, but the Justice Department doesn't dig into them as much. They get the admission of the bribery. They throw the internal controls in there with it, and that's what they run with. To me, this is a warning, and this is a warning that people – and notice the statement of facts in this case was not written by the SEC. It was written by the Justice Department. You can tell. And to me, that indicates that – and it went along with the non-prosecution agreement. And I think there's a very clear message here. It is, we, even in the absence of proving bribery, if we see circumvention of internal controls and we can sort of get over the hump and say in, implicitly prove that there was bribery without an admission or a direct uh, testimony of that in a circumstantial way, we're going to bring a criminal case. And that's, to me, a big worry because people need to pay more attention to what their internal controls look like and whether or not they're circumventing them. So BioRad is probably one of the more important cases in my view of the year. And I, you know, hate the little, you know, Alstom and all the other ones, but this is a really big deal in terms of what uh, the Justice Department is going to be able to do. 
Hewlett Packard for me is just another example of egregious conduct, uh, a, a huge cooperation effort, and a huge way of trying to get you know yourself out of trouble. And they've done that. Uh, and they they've done that. Um, so uh, they've done that, and we had slush funds, we had shell companies, we had bank accounts, we had separate, even the separate accounting records that basically this went through in Hewlett Packard, a distribution network, uh, and repurchasing of products uh, through inflated prices. So they would use the distribution chain to sort of hide the bribery money, get the bribery money to the officials in Russia. Uh, or Poland or in Mexico. So we had what I call the three-headed solution. Uh, they tried to make a big point here. Uh, there was extraordinary cooperation. Hewlett Packard was given the word extraordinary. And when you see extraordinary, that means extraordinary. Uh, they don't give that word out lightly. Um, number one, Russia pled guilty to a criminal charge. Poland got a deferred prosecution agreement, and Mexico got a non-prosecution agreement. And the Justice Department wanted to send a message that, hey, in these egregious cases, even with extraordinary cooperation, we're going to start uh, imposing as much as we can on each company. Um, whether it really makes a difference or is a hill of beans or just nothing, who knows. Uh, but it certainly hit Hewlett Packard hard. But on the other hand, Hewlett Packard extraordinary cooperation got them out of a very, very serious mess, uh, which could have been a worse case. The Smith & Wesson case, which I mentioned to you, I call the small company shootout. Uh, basically, this case grew out of the, uh, back in 2010, the Shot Sting case. Smith & Wesson official was caught up in one of those. Uh, <laughs> the individual, excuse me, was uh, obviously all the cases were let go or dismissed. Uh, DOJ declined prosecution of Smith and Wesson, um, and the SEC, which uh, has been using administrative proceedings now for fear of going to judges and having judges look at their cases, uh, out of because they had two bad experiences with uh, uh, a judge in the DC uh, circuit here. Um, they uh, they got a two million dollar settlement, and this was was interesting. With this was that. All that, for all the bribery activity, the gifts they gave out, Smith & Wesson in Indonesia and Pakistan, uh, they gave out guns, uh, they gave out, uh, you know, to a lot of people. Uh, they only secured one contract, which was with the Pakistani police for about $100,000. All the other ones, the bribery schemes in Indonesia and other countries were unsuccessful. They never got any money. Um, but here, what the point is, and this again, I think, goes is a more important case than people realize, is that the SEC is saying, look, we don't care if you're a small company, and we don't care if you weren't successful. Uh, we don't care that you didn't win a ton of contracts. We're still going to make you pay. Um, and uh, so this was, you know, I think the SEC sent a very good message in this to basically say, look smaller companies, you want to go into high risk markets, you better make sure you've got the controls in place and you better make sure that you are uh, enforcing those and uh, not getting into problems where you're paying bribes and we don't care what the results were. So um, look, DOJ declined, there's a reason for that. It obviously wasn't a successful or big enough case for them to get involved in. Um, and uh, Smith and Wesson did, a, you know, an internal investigation and really tried to argue uh, their situation. So, in any event, I think that Expenses, but when you have a system and it is a source of funding uh, and it can be used readily for uh, funneling bribery type payments, 
look, that's that's your worry uh, with gifts, meals, entertainment, and travel. I'm not saying that it's going to be one expenditure, but it's going to be a series of expenditures uh, that get you into trouble. And it's going to be where your controls aren't working or where people are circumventing those controls in terms of your um, uh, you know, approval process. Uh, for this. So the first case we had was the Bruker case, and this was an FTC case. And again, $2.4 million was paid for $230,000 in improper payments to officials uh, and suspicious collaboration agreements. So half of the money was used for these collaboration agreements, uh, which, and notice the important point here, they didn't prove that these were bribes. They look like bribery. There's no explanation for these collaboration agreements. What did they actually produce with these Chinese officials? Nothing, okay? And that's the point that they're getting into now. They're not proving necessarily bribery, but they're proving no legitimate explanation for what is otherwise suspicious. And this is why I'm saying uh, these are important precedent when you look into these cases more and more. Um, and it's why you can't just react to the headlines of Al Alstom and Avon. Here's a case which for many other, for, for people who are committed to compliance, that if you don't have that sort of due diligence justification, you're going to run into that problem. Uh, and so half of the money was used for gifts, meals, entertainment, and travel, and, you know, lavish travel and things like that for leisure travel. Um, and they focused right on the people who were making the contracting decisions. What a surprise. And uh, half of the money went to these suspicious collaboration agreements for which there was no uh, legitimate explanation. Um, so Bruker, I think, is an important reminder for us to all sort of, uh, you know, don't take the Volkoff approach on gifts, meals, entertainment, and, you know, belittle it. Uh, you better focus on it, and you better make sure that uh, your controls are working, not that you have to spend, you know, hours on hours about whether or not to give a government official a pen when they retire. Um, here, these are systemic uh, issues, and these were ways to funnel bribes. Uh, so that's an important point. Uh, let's go to the two individuals, Tims and Rashid, uh, who paid, I think it was $50,000 and $20,000 settlements. Uh, for improper gifts, meals, and entertainment to Saudi Arabia officials. Look, the, the, the fact about, and they also it, were involved in concealing the false book entries. Uh, they were creating fake invoices. They cover up. They, they were lying about uh, whatever. But it basically involved um, uh, giving a bunch of Saudi Arabian officials, and I think they had security cameras for FLIR systems, was trying to sell to the Saudi Arabian uh, government. And they gave the Saudi Arabian officials Rolex watches, and they gave them uh, and set up these world tours prior to visiting the Fleur facility. So, you know, I've always uh, encouraged people to use legitimate um, visits to facilities, use legitimate uh, marketing opportunities and promotional opportunities, and those are absolutely important uh, exceptions uh, that allow you. Um, do some uh, some travel and expenditures when there's training or there's touring. Uh, here, what they did is they set up like a lavish world tour prior to visiting the floor facility, and for weeks, uh, officials were taken to pretty you know lavish places, uh, and it reaped like a laundry list of like a world tour that you would want to take or I would want to take at some at some expense. So. Uh, combining that with the concealment, the fake invoices, the cover-ups, it's clear what happened here is the company came in and turned these guys in. Whether the company itself is going to get into trouble or whether they're, they were able to get a declination for themselves because of their cooperation, uh, we don't know because uh, that has never been disclosed. FLIR Systems has not disclosed the investigation, nor have they made any mention of this. But it's pretty clear that these two individuals uh, were turned in because uh, they discovered the problem, and their lawyers told them, let's go to the government and tell them all about this and cooperate, and hopefully we can keep ourselves out of trouble. Um, and we don't know what other sort of internal investigation was done by FLIR and what other type of problems that they may have uh, you know, revealed. 
The next uh, sort of interesting case, I think, uh, which got a little overblown because, uh, and no disrespect intended, but the lawyers who handled this case tried to you know, hold press conferences and webinars about how great uh, a job they did for Lane Christensen, uh, which is a water and energy company. Um, and I don't mean to insult them. Uh, but during a risk assessment, they were trying to, you know, put together a sort of very good program. They re they found out that there was bribery going on in Africa. Um, they earned the DOJ declination, and they got an SEC settlement for five million dollars. The important takeaway for me is, is this, um, and I've always urged clients to do this, or um, uh, a lot of times when they're dealing with the Justice Department, they let outside counsel do all the meetings uh, with the Justice Department lawyers, and I always say you should bring, assuming these people aren't involved in the conduct, you bring in the general counsel, you bring in important people from the company to indicate your your uh, commitment to uncovering what happened and uh, getting the truth out. In this case, Lane Christensen, they brought in uh, they had the the audit committee really ran the internal investigation, and the chair of the audit committee came to the DOJ SEC meetings. And to me, that sent an important message, and I do like that. And I think it was saying, look, we get it. We know we got a problem. Um, we're showing you how important this is to us. We're going to be here at the meetings, and we'll make the representation. But I'll look you right in the eye and tell you we're going to fix things. And that's what. Uh, and I think it, it had an impact, uh, and I've urged people to think about that uh, in other uh, contexts as well uh, when dealing with the Justice Department. So we basically had 80, 800,000 in bribes for over 3.9 million in business. Again, these were all regulatory and tax savings issues. They got customs clearance, immigration enforcement against uh, uh, against their you know their labor force. Uh, there were labor benefits issues, and they got tax savings as well. So all of this, uh, this was not a case where they were bribing to get uh, contracts. This was a case where they were bribing to get sort of the regulatory protections. But this was a case where they, from day one, they worked closely and basically communicated constantly with the Justice Department, earning themselves a declination, uh, but not getting themselves out of an SEC uh, problem. Uh, given the nature of the bribes and, and the amount that was involved. Uh, the SEC was not going to decline in the, this case. Uh, Mary Beanie is, you know, your recidivist. Uh, this was the second case against Mary Beanie because uh, they had been prosecuted uh, before. Um, and this was, they played a role in the Alstom scheme in Indonesia uh, and helped uh, pay bribes. Uh, in that case, they did not cooperate. Um, the question of whether individuals should be will be prosecuted, I don't know, given that the conduct is kind of old. But nonetheless, all some people were uh, prosecuted. And if there's any case you want to send a message to uh, individuals and to deter people, you can say, "Look, we're going to still go after you. Uh, the facts are pretty strong." Um, and instead, what the result is we got here was uh, to act tough. The Justice Department made Mary Beanie plead guilty to eight criminal counts and pay eighty-eight million dollars, which was in the range, in the middle of, you know, towards the top end of the range. But it was sort of in the middle. And uh, the question is: Is eight criminal counts uh, is the implications for Mary Beanie so, uh, you know, significant that they really did pay a price? Um, I don't know that charge bargaining and the way that they're structuring charges and whether or not somebody pleads guilty to a criminal offense, it has an impact on, um, you know, financial institutions, but, you know, the Justice Department has uh, sort of gone out of the way to make sure that, uh, you know, they're not going to lose their licenses. They will talk to the financial regulators. So is this really uh, a punishment enough for a recidivist? It's hard to say uh, with this case. A couple of other uh, quick notes, uh, aside from the cases that we talked about, remember the Esquinazi appeal in the 11th Circuit uh, and the definition of instrumentality uh, now includes state-owned enterprises and was upheld. Uh, we have a two-part test uh, now for uh, determining whether or not a state-owned company is an instrumentality. 
there's a new charge, a new challenge that's been raised in Siegelman, and I've written about this and just said, look, everybody should forget it. The government has the right, has the best argument here. You can keep on appealing, but you're wasting time. But the implications to me for pharmaceutical and medical device companies uh, who run into this issue a lot, all your doctors, all your healthcare officials, all your people in a hospital are all foreign officials for purposes of the FCPA and it's not going to change. So it means you've got, you're not going to start dividing up people on whether or not they're foreign officials or not at these state-owned companies. You've got to just basically treat them like they are foreign officials and, and your compliance program that way. We had an interesting opinion letter this year, which was 1402 on successor liability. Uh, there was one part of it that was uh, another profound grasp grab of the obvious, which is if I acquire a company and that company is not um, subject to the FCPA, when I acquire it and it, let's say it engaged in bribery, bribery, when I acquire it and I am subject to the FCPA, I cannot be held accountable as a successor liability for the past conduct of that company. That's nothing new. What was missing, however, and the important point is that opinion letter 0802, known as the Halliburton uh, opinion letter, which has very stringent conditions for uh, due diligence and uh, successor liability, post-acquisition liability, was not mentioned. And it's more evidence of this sort of relaxed uh, conduct or relaxed standard, which is giving basically companies 18 months from the date of closing uh, to integrate and conduct a post-acquisition audit to ensure uh, that the, due, the initial due diligence was accurate and uh, that you could go forward. So um, this was confirmation of the 18 months for integration. They are very, very uh, focused on the integration issue and they want the integration uh, dealt with as, their, um, as an important issue uh, in the uh, acquisition context. Okay, so for next year, what do we see for 2015? I've already mentioned some of the things. Uh, obviously, we have a tough environment that continues. It's an aggressive enforcement uh, environment. Um, watch what I'm talking about in terms of the focus on internal controls. We may see it this year, which is a criminal prosecution for circumvention of international internal controls. And uh, the standard is, you know, knowingly circumvent uh, you know, internal controls. And they're going to look for the right case to do it in, um, but without the bribery context um, or, with that, or where it's a circumstantial case. Uh, I think we'll see a resumption of sort of individual prosecutions um, in terms of particularly if they can go after senior executives like an Avon or Alstom or looking for BioRat in uh, Russia. Uh, I think we'll also see a focus on uh, if they can ever get to a corporate board member, they really want to do that. That's a big deal for them and senior executives uh, besides Avon. Um, the big cases that will be settled this year, uh, absolutely, I think we're going to see Embraer, Qualcomm. I think GSK is a very good chance, Microsoft possibly. Uh, there is an outside chance that Walmart, I think, by the end of the year could be uh, settled. I'm not sure about that, uh, but we'll have to see. Uh, it's more likely it'll probably go into 2016, but you could have sort of a rush to judgment at the end. Um, I think we'll see another big proactive case like the Sillins case uh, that we had two years ago. Uh, we have, there are more cooperators out there. They're more available for proactive work, and they're still looking for their Title III case. Uh, we'll see the global settlements. Uh, we may see another deference type case uh, and some uh, more. The Justice Department is going to give up certain control in cases where they trust the other government to uh, enforce uh, their own laws against a company that has more um, sort of uh, operations or more central locations in another country. Uh, like I said, we may see the first real UK Bribery Act case, and I think we're going to see more FCC cases with uh, gifts, meals, entertainment, and travel. Um, I think those are easier cases to put together and to prove. 
Uh, and uh, bribery is always hard to prove. Uh, remember that. Uh, most All these bribery cases are proved because people come in and confess to them. There's some real compliance program lessons, and I try to put some of these uh, together. Uh, the one thing, absolutely, the trend that's continuing is that DOJ and the SEC are much more sophisticated and much more aware of what's going on in ethics and compliance. They know the difference between what I would call a real culture of ethics and what are paper programs. They've talked like that for the last few years, but they're really holding people more uh, stringently uh, and holding them to t much more difficult uh, contexts in these situations. So, uh, in for some of the cases, uh, is, for example, uh, which are important is that they found, they made findings that the uh, uh, compliance program had inadequate resources, was ineffective. Um, and that to me is an indication that they, they're trying to send a message with regard to that. And I think they're going to focus more a little bit on uh, showing you what the review of the compliance program showed. Um, they look for and want to see the culture and top level commitment. If they don't see that, they're very, very skeptical about the whole program. If they don't see the CEO uh, and the board playing some role in this and really reiterating the importance and communicating upon this, uh, they're going to they're gonna have some problems with regard to your compliance program. Uh, internal controls is a new focus. And this means that I really would urge people to take a look at their internal controls. The really difficult thing with internal controls is that nobody wants to monkey with them. They want to have one set of controls for the whole globe. And the fact is, uh, it's much harder to put in or modify your controls, let's say in China or whatever, in, in response to specific risks. And they just, uh, people aren't doing it. And I think you're going to start to see people held more accountable on their internal controls. That's going to be one of the themes for this year. Um, like I said, bribery is hard to prove. Uh, circumvention of controls is not hard to prove. Um, and so they can cite contracts uh, that were improperly reviewed or money was paid for without proper verification of invoices, and they don't have to prove bribery, uh, and the justification is not present. Um, so they, the other point I would always urge people is to start to focus on your control and access to money. Um, just like you look at theft risks or fraud risks, you've got to look at how can people get money and how can they use it and how can they use it for improper purposes, including bribery, especially in your high-risk areas. Um, there's been more of a reiteration from the government on risk assessment and risk reviews. Uh, they don't want to see these done or not done. Uh, but they do want to see some risk assessment. You don't have to do the fancy dancy, you know, uh, uh, $150,000 ridiculous risk assessment. These can be done in cost effective ways, and I'm happy to help you with suggestions on how to do that. Uh, they want to see, obviously, your due diligence and management of your third parties and monitoring your business partners and managing them and making sure you have a real system in place to do that. There's more and more interest in the pre-acquisition due diligence for anybody that you're going to acquire. And then the integration issue that I talked about, including training of your new employees and making sure that an audit is done to make sure you know what you, you bought and know what you have. If your company has that strategy, please make sure you have policies in place and follow those policies uh, as best you can. Obviously, the new cutting edge area, uh, which is uh, appearing, is the relevant developments in the field and the evolving international and industry standards. They want to see people doing new stuff, monitoring, testing, auditing. They want to see more and more resources put into this area. They think it's the cutting edge area. They want you to catch you know, the bribery scheme that starts in China so that you don't end up, for example, with an Alstom situation where it's just deteriorated to nothing. If anything, the lesson that comes through a lot of this is if you see a problem, don't run away from it, deal with it, fix it, and keep putting out fires as you're going along. Do not let your culture deteriorate. Do not let your uh, system uh, start to uh, you know, erode 
and then all of a sudden you're playing catch up and you're just uh, in a in a horrible situation where nobody wants to deal with anything in that situation. Okay, thank you folks. I apologize for all our technical problems uh, today. Uh, sorry about all of that. Um, we're still here, the Volkoff Law Group. Uh, take a look at our new blog. We are obviously working with people on their uh, compliance programs, due diligence uh, systems, and uh, risk assessments. Uh, we also uh, are involved in enforcement defense. Uh, we're involved in a number of the cases. Um, we've offered a new in-house training program, uh, live and remote training. Uh, check out uh, the website there. Uh, all of the uh, webinars are on the YouTube channel. Uh, this one will be a little delayed, given you know, be a little rough uh, on the edges because of the uh, technical problems. Uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on LinkedIn, uh, and if you do want uh, copies of the um, slides, please let me know, um, and you can send uh, send those, that that uh, send that back. Um, and uh, so. We, um, uh, again, send me an email, and uh, that, then we'll go, uh, go from there, and I'll get you these. Um, again, thank you for attending. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to deal with any questions real quickly. Uh, one good question that came in uh, is uh, the BioRad case. In other words, uh, DOJ is acknowledging that if a company has a strong compliance program, and proves that the managers choose to ignore the compliance program, then the company will get a light fine, a slap on the wrist, but the individual will be prosecuted instead. And I think that's a good point. That's what's going to come out of BioRad, um, is that the managers there uh, let the, com the contracts go. They knew that they weren't getting uh, any services for it, and uh, ultimately they're the ones that are at risk, and there is a light fine. Uh, and that's a very good way of putting it and summarizing BioRad. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, uh, hopefully you'll sign up for next week. We won't have as much technical problems, hopefully, and uh, we'll be talking about sanctions and all the new risks in sanctions enforcement, which some people are calling the new uh, FCPA. But again, uh, I apologize about the technical issues, and please uh, send me an email, and I'll send you right away the, uh, the slides. Thanks again.